Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode six of Platform Enterprise, the show that platforms the projects and visions of people all over the world working hard to make their impact a positive one. I'm your host, Rachel Donald, and I also produce the Platform Enterprise newsletter, which is an attempt to report on what connects the financial, social and environmental crises we're experiencing by platforming stories underreported by a reactive news cycle. The story published each week is an investigation inspired by the interviews shared on this podcast. Both the newsletter and podcast will always be free, so if you enjoy them and have the means, please consider getting a paid subscription to the newsletter, which will enable me to keep sharing the stories that matter. Go to stories.platformenterprise.com to learn more. On the show this week, we have Hunter Bliss. Hunter is a printing engineer and founder of the Pebble Printing Group, and what he has to say about paper and plastic challenges everything we think we know about sustainability. Working out of China, Germany and the US, Hunter's mission is to bring stone paper to the publishing industry. Stone paper is one of those things that could actually change the world. And Hunter's vision for what it could achieve is especially exciting and necessary considering the climate crisis. I learned so, so much speaking with Hunter. So if you enjoy it, let us know in the comments and please do share it around. Thank you. Mm. Hunter, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Happy to do it. So um, you are a stone paper aficionado and a printing engineer. But why don't you give people a little bit of knowledge about your background, where you come from, where you've been, what you've seen? Yeah. Uh, so I come from the U.S. I, I left South Carolina when I was 18. Uh, I moved to Germany to originally study electrical engineering there. Um, and I switched around a little bit. I did a year of experimental physics in Munich. Um, and then when, I turned, then when it turned out I didn't like that that much, uh, I just went looking for something that I found interesting. And at the time, I've been traveling a lot uh, inside of Europe, uh, and I found this school in Stuttgart, the, um, the, the Hochschule der Medien. Um, they have print in Chinese, and I thought, hey, that'd be really cool because I've learned a lot in Germany, so why not just do that? And then, wow. uh, and then from there, you know, I, I learned Chinese, and I went to China for the first time, and I, you know, it's, it's been a learning experience pretty much the whole time, but you know, that was coupled with printing. And I got an, a formal education as a printing engineer. So then I, you know, came to China to work at a company called R. R. Donnelly. It's actually an American company, but a lot of their operations are here in China. It's one of the biggest printers in China, and uh, and that's where I started in business development. And that's where I discovered stone paper. Uh, actually, just on a post from a friend on LinkedIn. Yeah. I want to I want to pause before we get into that because I mean p- personally I have loads of questions already. <laughs> like okay. how does a kid from South Carolina <laughs> decide that he wants to go and study in <laughs> in Germany? It was actually it was actually a joke at first. Um I, I used to, <laughs> I, I used to play a lot of internet games mm-hmm. and I had some European friends that I played online with and as soon as I graduated high school they were asking me you know what I what do I want to do? And I already had my plans set. I was going to go to Clemson University in South Carolina which is actually a sister school of the HDM in Stuttgart. I did not know oh, that. that's funny. <laughs> um, I was going to go there, but then they said, you know, you should just apply for a school in Germany and see if you get it because there's no tuition. Um, so mm. I, I, I applied just to see if it would work out. And uh, yeah, I, I, got, I got accepted. And then um, I was like, mom, I think maybe I should go to Germany. We can save money. and It sounds fun. Yeah. Uh, so, then, so, so then I kind of just thought, you know, I'll, I'll go there. I still need to learn German to actually study there in German because it's a requirement from some of the bachelor's programs. And then uh, I studied German the first year at, at, in electrical engineering at a school for electrical engineering. Um, and then I switched over to the Technical University of Munich, um, where, I, where I wanted to become the next Nikola Tesla or the, the like, <laughs> physics, whatever. I, I really wanted to become Nikola Tesla, which was <laughs> silly. I had no idea what physics was at the time. <laughs> and um, yeah so that's that's why I left yeah 18 and moved to Germany okay so I'm kind of off the cuff and quite quickly you've learned two very very difficult languages German and Mandarin yeah. right mm-hmm. okay how have you found that uh German is okay like German compared to Chinese is really like a <laughs> park I mean it's not even uh, I, I've been learning Chinese now for, I guess, maybe five years. 
and I'm still I'm still learning new words every day. It's, hmm. it's the most insane language that I could think of. Um, but you know, German German was okay. I mean, I I learned German to, to a conversational level to almost near fluency in like a year or two years. But Chinese is not the same at all, and yeah, it's it's really not. Right. Okay. So you you got into working in R. R. Donnelly after graduating, and you saw a post about stone paper. Did I? Yeah, I did. Pick that yeah. Up? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, so one of my colleagues just posted a little showcase image of a of a journal that they had tested. Uh, it was just like a test print of a stone paper journal, and in her LinkedIn post, she said, "You know, it was made without trees and water." And I thought, "Whoa, that's really crazy!" Because my whole education revolves around trees and water. Mm, <laughs> um, sure. I mean, paper, so, paper. Paper was a whole science when we studied print. It, we we did it for maybe two years. And just the science of how paper is made, and it, it's all the same stuff. It's just fiber-based materials. Okay, uh, so what is stone paper then? Uh, stone paper doesn't have any fibers. It's in the, in the case of paper, it's eighty percent calcium carbonate and twenty percent HDPE. In the case of board, it's sixty percent calcium carbonate and forty percent HDPE. But it's basically just a combination of stone powder and HDPE. Which is a form of plastic, uh, and it's turned into sheets, just like paper, just just like we understand paper now. Uh, but it's you know remarkably different. There's a lot to sort of break down there because you hear the word plastic, yeah. uh, tree free, water free. There's a lot of potentially conflicting ideas about uh, a material like that. Yeah. Um, so before we get into the the science of it, or perhaps also the political discussion of it, mm -hmm. um, what happened then in your career? Because you no longer work at R.R. Donnelly. So how did you get to so, founding Pebble? Uh, so around the time that I had start, I had started writing my first white paper on stone paper, which is the white paper that's featured on the website about European paper. Um, I started having visa issues, uh, work visa issues. Um, R. Donnelly was not was not willing to help me get a work visa at the time that I was having some issues with my bachelor's thesis um, and getting my getting my diploma from the school early and stuff like that. Uh, so that was pretty annoying. Um, and I felt really unsupported by R. Donnelly, especially being the only foreigner in the company here. Um, right. and I, I, I just thought to myself, you know, if I, if I'm going to continue to do this, which, which is a product I believe in stone paper, um, I'd rather just do it with my own company and just own it myself. So, uh, I left and I got a, I got a work visa with a supplier, much more flexible. Um, and then, yeah, that's basically how Pebble started. I, I registered it in the, uh, I registered in the U S so it's a U.S. registered company. Um, and my work visa is with a supplier that's registered here in China. Fantastic. And what do you do? Mostly marketing and sales right now, honestly, you know, I, I don't actually own the printing equipment myself. I just know how it's printed and I know what we need to do because it's stone paper. The real challenge for stone paper is spreading it and spreading mm -hmm. the knowledge of it. Most, I mean, most people in my experience uh, don't even know what stone paper is yet. It's it's something like 17 years old. Um, it depends. I mean, there's you know 1998 it was founded or it was invented. So you know you consider it 22 years old, which is really young for a paper material. Um, mm. Now now the real the real struggle is basically using Pebble to uh, promote stone paper. Right. Okay. And right. why why do you believe so much in stone paper? I mean, do you want to see stone paper become used in people's day to day life, or does it have some kind of specific use? Could it replace it's, paper? It's just it's just straight up the lowest impact material that we have available right now. Uh, synthetic papers are not new, but stone paper's composition of eighty, especially for publishing purposes, of eighty percent calcium carbonate and twenty percent HDPE is really low impact. It does not require a lot of resources. And I think for that reason, uh, it could prolong what we know as paper for hundreds of years. Whether it needs to supplement paper or completely replace it in some applications, I would argue it needs to replace it in some applications, but it could prolong this, this sort of substrate, this concept of a substrate that we have for the whole human population for as long as possible, because normal paper can't do that. Why can't normal paper do that? Normal paper can't do that because paper consumption is growing really fast. And when you look towards Asia especially, and you consider how much paper is being consumed already by developed Western countries, and you think the po and you and you calculate paper consumption on a per capita basis, just as an example, 
you start to get really scary numbers from China and India. And mm -hmm. if you were to consume a similar amount of paper per capita as most developed Western countries, then the forests of the world are in trouble, uh, which they are already now. Um, and the water is in trouble too. Uh, you're sitting in Europe, you know, your water scarcity is already a problem in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. And I think Spain is one example. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we need to, we need to plan better for how we make this kind of paper material for the whole world. Okay. So everybody, I think, knows that, um, you know, paper is made with trees and that involves cutting down trees and whatever. But, you know, we have, there's a couple of things that I want to touch on quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, you keep mentioning water. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about whatever water problem there is with using traditional paper? And then also, I mean, we recycle paper. So yeah. what's the big problem? Um, so paper recycling, of course, uh, is not a 100% uh, process. Um, the quality degradation is a real issue with paper recycling. So in the case of like graphic papers for books, um, I'm, I've been doing a lot of work with books lately um, for graphic papers. Unless you have a lot of chemical additives, you cannot recycle paper and then make high quality book papers out of it. Um, as soon as you recycle paper once, it's going to become cardboard pretty much. You know, it's going to become that low, that low quality brown kind of material that most people know is, is sustainable. Um, you're always adding virgin fibers. Um, what, what does that mean, virgin fibers? Uh, you're always adding fibers that are cut down from trees directly, directly from the tree itself. So uh, even when you recycle paper, it needs fresh trees. Exactly. To... Right. Okay. And pa paper also is limited uh, in its recyclability. So um, on average in Europe, paper is recycled three times, uh, but the maximum, you know, is seven times, um, you know, plastic three times. is much higher. What? Uh, three times. Yeah. Three times is the average. It's measured by some Swiss uh, paper administration. I forget. It's interesting because in the past maybe five to 10 years, there's been a switch that papers become the real green material and everybody's trying to switch from plastic to yeah. paper. Yeah. But what you're saying is that it uses a lot of trees, mm -hmm. uh, it uses a lot of water and yeah, it can't be- a lot of electricity. A lot of electricity, it yeah. can't be recycled. Okay, let's let's keep talking about the reduction of paper then. Let's get into the water thing. What What's the issue with water? Uh, yeah, so the you know the classic statistic is you know every A4 sheet of paper that you might find in your office takes ten liters of fresh water. That's actual you know drinking water. Um, it's a, drinking it's, water. It's a, it's a crazy amount of water, um, and you know you you basically need that because paper starts out uh, I think ninety eight percent water. It starts out as a pulp when it comes out of the machine. So you mm. know these these wooden fibers all ground up and then they're mixed with a bunch of water. And then they're basically poured with all of this water, they're poured onto a screen and the screen kind of filters out those fibers. And as it filters out the water, the less water there is, the more uh, uh, combinations, you know, the more, the more those fibers come together. So through a very long machine that requires a lot of heat, um, it has to be reduced from 98% to something like 3% or 2% water content. And that's 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 done on you know massive, massive like rolls. a giant hair dryer. It's a giant hair dryer. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It uses a lot of energy. I mean, I I don't mean to call them out, but UPM, uh, UPM in South Germany, they have a plant there. They have a dedicated power plant just for that paper mill. It's crazy. They, they find make, it more cost effective to build their own build power their own plant. Power plant. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I mean, what are what are the statistics? I think I've read something like the paper, the pulp and paper industry is actually like the fourth most energy intensive um, industry in the world. Yeah, and it's it's, it, it's actually funny. I actually have a, a thing a thing right next to me right now. Something that I printed that I printed today. Um, use it, one stun, one stun, <laughs> one ton <laughs> of stone paper. Uh, compared to traditional paper, saves 18 trees, 280 kilowatt hours of energy, 949 kilograms of CO2, and almost 3,000 liters of water. Just one ton of paper. Per ton, yeah, per ton. Per ton, now, okay. Keep, now keep in mind that the paper supply for the world is almost 400 million tons. Per year? Yeah. 
<laughs> Holy hell. Hang on. So who's good at math? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's let's I, well, I don't even want I can't even how much CO2 would that save? I mean uh, a lot. <laughs> a lot. One point two trillion kilograms of CO2. Christ all over the place. Wow. That yeah. is a lot of CO2. So yeah. hang on, I don't get it then. I mean, if if paper is mm -hmm. actually, hang on. So if paper is using a lot of trees and it's mm -hmm. using a, a hell of a lot of water and mm -hmm. it can't be efficiently recycled and the energy required to make it requires its own power plant, no. why, why does it have this green status? This is the thing that I have been really thinking about and really brewing over for the past two weeks, I guess. It's because people think that paper is renewable. People think that trees are renewable, which is kind of true, kind of. But the, re the, reality of the, of the reality of the situation is, is that soil is not renewable. When we, are mi when, we, when we are making paper from trees, we are mining minerals from the soil in the exact same way that we are mining minerals for stone paper. Stone paper is just more direct and doesn't use as many resources on the way. Right. So that's the, re that's the main reason that people think that paper is more environmentally friendly because trees are quote unquote renewable. Right, so people think that you can keep planting trees in the same place. You can't, uh, because exactly. no, we people, can't. You can't, especially when you consider tree plantations where trees are grown and they are cut down and they're made into paper and they are not replanted. It is literally just mining minerals from the soil. It's just an indirect way of doing this. Yeah. And I, I just, I, uh, I, I, you know, it's a really successful, it's really easy to market, especially if you consider, you know, oil spills. When, when you consider that plastic, uh, plastic ocean pollution is a real problem. It's a real problem coming from Asia specifically. Um, in, in Western countries, it's it's more or less negligible, but it really is a problem coming from Southeast Asia. Um, but you know, oil pollu oil pollution, oil spills, and plastic litter is really easy to show people the direct effects. Global warming is much slower. Global global warming is the priority that we're forgetting. You know, that global warming is the thing that's going to displace you know a billion people around the world that live on the coasts of their countries, uh, and that's that's what we have to fight against. But you know, if I can take a picture of animals eating plastic or dying covered in oil, then it's just easier. It's easier to shock people. So th this is um, what's sort of known as like end of life versus life cycle impact. And plastic has come under so much fire because as you, I mean, it's a PR nightmare, plastic, it because yeah. it doesn't degrade and it gets caught and you have like, I mean, turtles yeah. with their heads stuck in stuff and and it really is it's upsetting it's it's shocking and and it, i think the thing is as well is it, it's preventable yeah. um and it's an action that consumers can take and companies can take and it and it, and it does do good impact but as you're correctly saying is mm -hmm. it doesn't actually do anything to stop global warming apart from well, maybe you know oh, mining less for fossil fuels yeah so um you, you know what you're saying when we're looking at you know life cycles of materials um you know, there are, there are two different points, you know, life cycles of materials. If you're looking at the life cycle from paper from the beginning to end versus the life cycle of plastic from beginning to end, what you're going to definitely, what you will definitely see is that plastic is way more efficient in production. It's really, really efficient in production and doesn't use nearly as much power. Basically that, you know, that's where, that's where the carbon emissions ultimately come from is where the power comes from the power the plants. Um, so already at the beginning, plastic is winning. Um, mm -hmm. throughout its life cycle. Plastic lasts way longer. It's way more durable. It's non-toxic. Um, it, there are a number of qualities why plastic will always be used, especially in packaging and in a lot of printing applications, um, because paper just can't do, do the same thing and maintain the same low weight and the quality. Um, but at, you know, at the end of the life cycle, uh, there are... The, the current rate of plastic recycling compared to paper is lower. Globally, plastic is around 8%. Paper, I think, is almost 30%. But 8%. 8%. 8%. But wow. plastic, but if you consider the recyclability of plastic, uh, it's far more recyclable than paper. 
uh, melting down melt, melting down plastic and reforming plastic is can be done a lot more times without quality degradation than paper. But not even but not even that part is what people need to be thinking about. What they what people need to realize is that plastic and paper both when you when, when you throw them away and they're not sorted, they will go to the landfill. And neither of them will biodegrade, none of them will photodegrade, none of them will degrade in any way. They will just sit there. So the the important thing that we need to focus on right now is from the production point, minimizing the impact. And on the other side, what well, you're saying too, that it's preventable. That's another really important point. Um, preventing ocean pollution is really, really important, but it's really important. Uh, I, I emphasize again, it's really important here in Asia to control plastic pollution because people here are not aware, are not nearly as aware um, as Western as, as Western developed countries of what plastic does to the environment. Mm. So, uh, you know, we, we have to we have to work on controlling plastic pollution, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that plastic is probably one of the most innovative materials of the last thousand years. Because it can be recycled so much more than paper, um, because how durable it is. I mean. Would you then say that the plastic is a material for the circular economy? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, when we when, when as we develop certain, it's called de-inking uh, processes, uh, basically removing printing ink from plastic products. Um, and, and as we as we start to move away from putting dyes in plastic, that's another thing that hampers the recyclability of plastic is like these colored containers um, mm. that have dyes in them. Um, so as we improve the recyclability of plastic, this, this is how we will achieve a circular economy where we can actually recycle things for, you know, 10 times for generations and keep using them. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's, just, it's a key to the circular, circular economy. Um, you know, I, I, it's still important to say that ocean pollution is, is something that we should work against. Um, and, and people who work in plastics should actively, you know, work against that stuff. And actually fund ocean cleanups, but you know if you can if you look towards paper as a circular product, um, you just see a downward facing slope. It just goes down. It just turns to dust every time. Right. Okay. So if we imagine that the world that that we had a hundred percent recycling capabilities, because this is the other thing that that I seem to come across in like my research, mm -hmm. is that like all the tech that we need to do better is there we just need to do better <laughs> we, yeah like, yeah, we you really know, <laughs> yeah yeah you know if every so if everybody had a hundred percent recycling capabilities all over the world what you're saying which would solve a lot of problems that we're facing mm -hmm. it would solve i mean the pr nightmares in terms of plastic and it would solve not having to go and get as much foil fossil fuel out of the earth and da 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 um if we could recycle everything at hundred percent, what you're saying is paper is never going to be circular and plastic could be because you can just keep recycling that plastic right. infinitely. Whereas right. paper, you're always going to need fresh trees. You're always going to need fresh water. And mm. as far as I can see from my research as well, it's going to produce a hell of a ton of waste. It's actually a huge yeah. water polluter as well. Yeah. Whereas plastic is kind of this like closed loop where it just, you put it in, melt it down and make more shit out of it. Um, more, yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. So where does stone paper then fit into, cause we're talking about plastic and paper. Hmm. So where does stone paper fit there? So, uh, you know, going back to your, your first point a second ago that, uh, the, you know, the, the tech, the tech is there, but we need to do better. And, um, you know, we need to reach 100% recyclability. Uh, I think at this point in the development of just human consumption, um, we have to do as best we can with what we have. Um, I, I personally, I, I don't think the tech is there to reach 100% on paper or, um, or plastic right now. Um, there are a lot of really interesting things being done. Um, but basically we just need to reduce our, our impact as much as we can in the production of materials. And, um, and that, and that goes, you know, what stone paper's role is. And it really is just to prolong while minimizing the impact on our environment, prolonging this, this 
printing material that we all need responsibly. Uh, you know, we need to we need to we need to realistically look at the way that paper consumption is growing and the way we make paper, and we need to understand how quickly we're going through the raw materials because both 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 substrates will use raw materials. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what raw materials that won't come back. Um, and we and we need to aim. You know, we need to aim to like we need to aim to fulfill you know a thousand year goal. We we need to we need to be able to say that this material or this combination of materials, whether it be stone paper and paper together, or just stone paper and these, and then paper and these applications, um, we need to make a goal for the planet that we can we can go under emissions and waste for a thousand years mm. under a certain level. And that that you know will give us time to get the tech there, as you're saying. Okay. But why is stone paper necessarily the um, the material to do that? Like, can you give some more insights on the the properties that make it so, so special? It's it's a little complicated, but you need to, we need to prioritize the resources that we need most to maintain a healthy world for humans. And the resources that are directly targeted by paper production are trees and water. Uh, these are two very important resources. One's a carbon sink, and one is you know how we live. You know, it's a little more important. <laughs> than most other resources. <laughs> um, st stone paper can bring us to just basically just rocks. And uh, it's also a misconception that most plastic come from, comes from oil. More than half the plastics in the US come from natural gas. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it, it's, 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 a, it's still a fossil fuel, but it, it's not oil, it's natural gas um, okay. in the US at least. But it can, it can, it can shift the, the products that we consume away from trees and water to stuff that we don't need as much, like rocks and oil. We don't need oil as much as we need trees and water um, or, or fossil fuels. You know, we can we can we can live without fossil fuels if they run out, but we cannot run out. We cannot live if we run out of water and trees. Mm. OK, so switching away from natural resources, mm. um, it has a, a lower carbon footprint than mm. traditional paper. Uh, mm. What about the waste produced with stone paper? Uh, so waste is photodegradable. Uh, did I say waste is photodegradable? I meant stone paper is photodegradable. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so stone paper is photodegradable. But of course, I, th I think we need to personally better understand what is left behind in the dust that stone paper leaves behind. Um, other than that, stone paper can be incinerated without toxic emissions. Uh, that's confirmed because HTPE is a clean burning plastic. Uh, it, it turns into carbon oh, dioxide wow. and water. Specifically, it, it doesn't release any toxic emissions. Um, and you can you can test that yourself with stone paper. You know, you just you, you light it on fire and you can see that it leaves behind calcium carbonate, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, waste wise, um, you know, just recycle it. You know, it, it's it's a it's a channel two recyclable material. So it's recyclable mm -hmm. like other HTPE products. Um, and other than that, you know, in, in production, it's, it, it shares a similar quality with paper. Uh, paper in production, when it, right when it comes out of the machine, uh, you can take it from that line, you can take the trimmings off the paper and you can throw it back into the pulper and you can make pulp out of it. Same thing works with stone paper. Um, so, you know, in, in production, you could say it's like 100% recyclable. Um, mm. Okay. Does so, it do the do the plants produce any waste like paper? No, no, they don't. Uh, the pa the paper waste. There's no paper waste. But even more important is that there's no water waste. Water waste is a really big issue for paper companies. A lot of regulations in Europe on poisoning public waters with uh, yeah. paper. I think it's called sludge. The official uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah the what's yeah. it the official effluent of uh, pulp yeah. paper plants is called sludge. Yeah, yeah, I think that says all. So these so these stone paper plants, there's no sludge, there's no toxic water no, no, because no. the production's water free. Yeah, and I, I, I'd be interested. I'd be interested to see. Um, I'd be interested to see those claims holding up as stone paper scales up because right now stone paper is not even a hair of what paper is doing. Hmm. You know, the stone paper, stone paper, the biggest stone paper factories in the world are like tiny little baby paper shops. Hmm. Um, and they really, they don't have any waste, but you know, it would, it would truly, it would almost, it would be revolutionary if 
we could scale up to the size of regular paper factories and maintain that same kind of sustainability, that zero waste. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, then this is actually a good point. How can we be so sure uh, to throw our weight behind a new product and support it when we haven't seen it scale up? Yeah. And yeah, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I actually, I have, I have a good example. You know, getting the public getting behind the material, I think, should happen in steps. Uh, you know, it, it's not we're not we're not trying to cheat consumers here. Uh, we ourselves can only go on the data that we have, and the stone paper industry supports itself. You know, uh, we can't we don't get government grants to you know do huge research projects on stone paper. It's still very very small. Uh, I just said that the the global paper output is 400 million tons per year. Stone paper is barely even 200,000 tons, so okay. it's not even it's not even one percent. So the first thing the first thing that stone paper needs is just a chance at all to matter in 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 anyone's lives first. Uh, you know, stone paper as it stands right now, it could be a scourge on the environment if it really were. And it still wouldn't make a difference because it's so small. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so first, so first, so first with the data that we have, uh, which looks very promising, we just need to give stone paper a start. <laughs> right. And what if we're wrong? <laughs> then we're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it it doesn't. It doesn't look like we will be wrong. Um, okay. There's there's nothing there's nothing that I could think of between the size of stone paper now and as it scales up that would be a huge issue production wise. Um, mining is definitely an issue that will if if stone paper were to grow the same size of traditional paper. Um, a, a really good a really good stat is that um, tree plantations for lumber um, and paper around the world cover around uh, 3 million um, square kilometers. Those are plantations. Um, and mines cover around 60,000 square kilometers. Right. So, you know, if we, if we really did replace paper with stone paper, I, I think mining would be an issue we'd have to look into. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, mining, mining and the sustainability of mining is also a very complicated topic, just like recycling and, and even paper recycling, whatever you want to talk about. Um, so, you know, we, we would need to, we would need to make sure that we mine sustainably and mm. we would need to, we would need to make sure that we reduce our dependency on fossil fuels while also increasing the recycling rate of plastic. Okay. Because this is the thing. I mean, you, you always have to start with an end goal in mind, right? And I, I'm thinking about it. And I mean, if imagine bang uh stone paper has re replaced traditional paper and oh double bang uh we have 100 percent recycling capabilities yeah. um now because ugh, consumption is still growing as you say i mean pretty much with everything around the world mm -hmm. um you need fresh uh materials for fre for virgin products every year because you always need more made but if we got recycling up mm -hmm. and people recycled as much as they do I mean, because you don't need virgin products to pre to recycle this material, mm -hmm. surely, you know, it, it's still better. Surely there is a point where you kind of like plateau in terms of what you're mining and, and what you're using because the recycling rate of these infinitely recyclable materials is so high. Yeah, yes, yeah, so we could, you know, so we, we could, it, in, a, in a circular economy, you know, talk, I'm talking about ideal recycling, you know, 100%. Yeah. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying that we will ever get there. Honestly, 100. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, we we can sustain a supply of paper being used by a population at a given time. But the but the human population will continue to grow. So mm -hmm. the demand will continue to grow, and countries will continue to develop. And there's a direct correlation between the development of a country and its paper usage. <laughs> so you know as as you know, other most of the countries of the world that aren't developed right now, you know, come online and they and they come to the to the way the world is working uh, for other developed countries. Um, well, yeah, the supply will have to keep growing. Um, but you know, that's 
that's that's the acknowledgement that's most important for true sustainability. You know, if we if we keep making trees to make paper for for humans for the whole human population, or if we you know allocate a part of the Earth's crust to making paper, there is there's way more rock in the in the Earth's crust than there are trees. And as as we established earlier, soil is not renewable. Yeah. I, I, either way, either either path we go, we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to be using the most of? Yeah. What 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 are what are we going to sacrifice for this? So okay. Well, yeah. then, wh why sacrifice anything at all? Because you know, I see people uh, going like paperless, going mm -hmm. digital, like that's some kind of sustainable revolution, which is a whole other sort of conversation. Yeah. Um. And why is paper so important? Like, what are we printing on paper that is so important? So about the about going paperless, uh, I, I actually agree that, you know, that could reduce carbon emissions and materials in general. It could reduce the use on materials compared to paper. But what it does not reduce the use on is the things that are used to make electronics. Electronics are very complicated. You know, stone paper is, is those two ingredients. That's it. There are no additives, but electronics, I, I don't even know how many different minerals go into making electronics, but they have one, you know, one Kindle has a much larger carbon footprint than, you know, a bunch of books. Um, so I, I while, mm -hmm. while I, while I agree that, you know, going paperless honestly is a good way to um, reduce our impact on, on the environment compared to paper. Um, it still has its environmental impact. And, and as someone in the printing industry, it it just ha go being paperless and, and Kindle and ebooks for some reason have not caught on fast enough, you know, to what they were being predicted. Uh, you know, they were it was they were predicted to completely replace paper. Mm -hmm. You know, we were gonna you, you could store a thousand books on a device, but you know, especially in, in countries like Ger in Germany, you're only seeing you know s single digit growth of those industries of of paperless publishing, for example. Uh, another uh, another thing about packaging as well, um, packaging cannot go paperless because we're li we're literally limited by physics in that way. We can, <laughs> we we cannot transport a hamburger electronically. You see <laughs> yet? <laughs> uh, no, and maybe you know maybe I'm not and not to say that we should be eating hamburgers. You know, meat is a different thing that we could, you know can talk about in sustainability. <laughs> but you know, physically, humans need things and they have to be transported. And the transport has certain requirements for, you know, safety. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And then I think, um, like you mentioned books and publishing and eBooks and stuff. No. Um, one of the things that maybe I was trying to aim at to discuss is like, mm -hmm. well, books are a hugely important part of culture and whether yeah. we go full ebook or whether we remain, you know, with the the physical product, we definitely mm -hmm. need to be maintaining the materials that are used to print books or at least to make books. Mm -hmm. Because a culture without books, much like a culture without art, without literature, without dance, without this sort of creative expression and also this historical um record of mm -hmm. of what we are and who we are and I mean that that's a dangerous culture. It, the the argument, mm -hmm. you know, the argument, the, the argument that was made to us when we were going through the history of paper and the history of civilization and the beginnings of our printing engineering studies, uh, paper is a paper itself. It doesn't matter if it's made of trees or stone, whatever. Paper is a fundamental requirement for civilization to exist. Um, mm. Without without paper, there's no culture. Um, there. I mean, if, if you, especially if you consider where where civilization where civilization comes from around the whole world, it all comes from books. It all, in specifically specifically in the West for Europe and America, it comes from the Bible. Uh, mm. the, histori historically, printing the Bible was basically the you know the the invention of movable of movable type and the printing press basically made knowledge ac accessible. It made education possible for everyone. Um, that that's what paper does, and paper still does that. Uh, paper, um, yeah, paper paper is just like the first building block to uh, to civilization in, in general. And, and if we if we don't have it, we just don't have one. There's there's there, there's no way to communicate. 
Yeah, sure. Fire wheel paper, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it, really, it really is. If it, paper paper was invented, paper was invented like 3,000 years ago or something like that. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Uh, 2,000. 2,000 years ago. 2,000, okay. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's such an important point because whenever, um, you know, whenever a, a regime takes over a country, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the first things to be banned or to go or to be burned is books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, they're, they're tools of the ed education, as you say, and an educated people is an empowered people and empowered people. Well, they like to make their own decisions about what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so it's I think it's a really, really for me, you know, as a lit as a lit grad, essentially, I think mm -hmm. it's a really interesting um, conversation point about sustainability as well is like, what are we going to focus on and what are we going to prioritize? Yeah. Um, that, that's really yeah. that, that's the question. I mean, that's uh, I, I I just I see I see these huge companies like uh, Story Enzo, UPM, these huge paper makers. Uh, those two are you know the biggest paper companies in the world, and I see the way they're marketing things, and I just I don't see I, I don't see a planetary way of thinking about paper making. I see sort of this short sighted. Uh, marketing strategy that kind of kind of wavers with consumers attitudes but what really what really needs to happen if we want to be responsible with our planet is we need to think together you know how many hundreds of years can we keep making paper the way we're making it right now and it, and it still be responsible at that time oh well we can't we're due to run out of forest by 2099 yeah if we I mean, we're not making those considerations and you know that's that's that, you know that's that's the kind of responsibility that I think people, if not already, should be thinking about when they're thinking about you know eco friendliness or being environmentally friendly, is really is really considering how we go about treating our planet. Absolutely. Let's talk about that a little bit then, because I think um, there's a huge swathe of, of people in the world that really, really want to do right. They mm -hmm. want to use their purchasing power to support the the, the right products, the right companies. Uh, mm -hmm. They're very, very clued in to what the consensus is of what is good and bad. And just essentially kind of what's happened is along the way, um, we've sort of lost sight of the interconnectedness of things because it's very, very easy to look at paper and plastic at the end of life and be like, well, obviously paper looks way better because I, you know, I, it doesn't get stuck around a turtle's neck. Yeah. Um, so it's this sort of, I don't think it's fair to say that con consumers are short sighted in that way. I think, you know, there's a lack of education around. And obviously there, I mean, there must be battles going on between these huge corporations like plastic and paper and I'm sure yeah. PR, all sorts of PR stuff um, going on to make us choose one over the other. Um, but let's talk about other uh, materials being used to replace plastic at the moment. Let's take the classic bamboo toothbrush. Yeah. This is, yeah. So what we're seeing now is like plant-based materials replacing plastic. And mm. from our conversation, I'm gonna sense that, that you, you think that that is not a good thing to do. Can you talk more about why? <laughs> no, I just, I, it's so it's so backwards. It's so It's so backwards, you know, the whole point the whole point of using fossil fuels is using something that we don't need. It's using something that isn't essential to the life of humans. Right. It, it is, it's not physically essential to our bodies. If we move it to corn or bamboo or sugar cane or these or, or uh, in paper, you have even more. You have even more different like fibers that you can choose from. Um, we're just uh, especially in the case in, in the case of things that people can consume. Um, if if the plastic is being manufactured purely from waste of those products, that's fine. If it's just a waste product of the corn that we are already consuming, that's fine. But if we if we found a plastic industry on corn waste, eventually we won't be using the waste. Eventually we will be planting corn for the sole purpose of making plastic. And this goes back again to basically mining minerals from the earth. It's the same thing. Uh, and it uses tons of land and humans need land to live. 
It uses land right. and food. And right. Okay. That's just it's it's a backwards idea. We 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 need to we need to concentrate on responsible use of fossil fuels now. Let's break it down a bit. Okay. So using food source when we already have starving people using a food source to create plastics when we already have a material for creating plastics that is infinitely recyclable yeah. just because it's a fossil fuel and fossil fuel is a bad rep like we're you're sick we're moving backwards essentially yeah. right if, okay if, if you did like if you did some rough calculations like uh plastic uh the, the global oil consumption um of, of all of the of, of all of the oil that you think that we use uh, in the world, you know, you get a you get an estimate of around four to eight percent goes to plastic. So when four when, to eight percent of that, that all just, the fossil fuel goes to plastic, yes, goes to plastic. That it's just a testament to how efficient plastic is. If you if you if you think about that, and you think about how much plastic you encounter in your life, all of that plus all of the plastic that everyone encounters in their lives, including single use plastics, is only four percent of the global oil consumption. This is so efficient. It's it's so it's so radically efficient. This material, uh, it's obviously a, it, it's obviously a candidate for something that, that we could use for hundreds of years. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Mm -hmm. Plastic, the plastic that we encounter every day, every single freaking plastic thing I've ever seen is only four yeah. percent of the oil consumption, and we're only recycling eight percent of it. Yeah. So if we got recycling up to even the same level of paper, 30%. Don't even, don't even, I mean, don't even, don't even worry about recycling. Wow. If, we use, if we use virgin plastics forever, if we use, if we use virgin plastics forever and we, and we cut off our reliance on uh, fossil fuel based cars and fossil fuel based uh, power generation, uh, we could, we could use plastic, virgin plastics for almost 800 years. Right. That you know, that's that is a really long time. And yeah, that's you know, that's that's the kind of thinking that we need going forward. You know, we can't we, we can't look at it and say, oh, well, you know, we'll make a we'll make a perfect solution. They'll be perfect forever. Like, no, we have these limited resources and we have to use them as long as we can. And in this case, that's a crazy idea that we could use plastic as it exists now, never recycle it and still get away with like 800 more years of use. Yeah. So I imagine, imagine like the yeah. recycling tech behind that and reusing like, and thousands, yeah, thousands of years, thousands, thousands of years. So it really is a material for the circular economy. Yeah. Until yeah. this, this is so contrary to what everybody thinks right now. Yeah. It's, uh, it's quite, um, there's, there's, oh, I don't there's, know. There's, there's this, there's this strong, there's this strong, uh, there's this strong trend that, you know, what is low quality brown paper is the kind of sacrifice that we have to make to make the environment better. It's like, it, that's like, that's like that, the, the sacrifice of quality is, excuse me, the sacrifice of quality is the sacrifice that consumers are willing to make in order to, in order to feel like they are helping the environment. But we don't have to do that. Mm. So, you know, we can, we can, we could use stone paper for most printing applications and, and be rest assured that even if we throw it all away and, you know, hopefully it doesn't end up in the ocean, but even if we throw it all in the landfill, we're still okay. You know? Mm. Right. We can still, we can still survive. Yeah. Because we're not using trees. Because we're not using trees and water. Not... Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. You can rest. You can rest assured that if we continue to use paper, there will be no more water or trees on Earth. It would, it with with all of the people on Earth using as much paper as as they're using now, or you know, the, like I was saying with Asia, uh, using as much paper as they're expected to be using, we can very well expect that the rainforests will go away as they already are in South America and in Indonesia, two huge sources of primary fibers. Rainforests make really good paper. Yeah, they also make really good oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oceans, the, ocean, right. the, ocean, the ocean is the number one carbon filter. So, you know, we, we yeah. take care of our oceans. But second is forests. Wow. Well, um, forest is not a plantation also. The, the summary of what I'm getting from you 
is yeah. that we have this infinitely recyclable, durable material which uses a resource that we don't need to live or breathe or eat or whatever. And there's enough of it, fossil fuels, essentially. Yeah. Um, so we have plastic and plastic, it could be sort of the, I don't know, the, the foundation of the circular economy if we yeah. adjusted our relationship to how we use fossil fuels in other areas. Exactly. But what we're doing is we're seeing a switch away from that and switch to more quote unquote natural uh, materials to yeah. create things because that looks greener. Because a plas uh, uh, you hold up a plastic um, toothbrush and a bamboo toothbrush and the one that looks like it's made out of something that grew out of the ground looks more natural and it you know, yeah. looks better for the environment. We're going backwards, as you say, yeah. moving away from plastic. Um, whereas the circular economy is kind of right at our fingertips. There's just a point that I want to make. Like we have seen this because of the the relationship that we have with consumption as a society. Um, mm. You know, almond milk was a huge thing. It still is a huge thing. Mm. Um, and that was meant to replace animal agriculture. And actually what happened was the demand got so high. Um, we started cutting down rainforests to plant almond mm. um, plantation, almond fields. Yeah. And it's the same with soy. <laughs> so we have a tendency to um, abuse the materials that we need, uh, which makes our relationship to sustainability very difficult. But yeah. we have plastic and we have stone paper. Mm -hmm. And these two things combined could be used to replace a lot of the natural resources that we need to live and breathe and have a happy life on this planet. I'm also thinking of Elon Musk, like maybe he'll get to Mars and find that there's a whole bunch of calcium carbonate there to make stone paper. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that's, that's, that, that's, that's what we're talking about. The, the timescales, uh, when I say that we need to be thinking about this on a planetary scale, what I'm saying is that we need to be able to make paper until we can leave Earth or until we can go into our oceans. You know, this is like this is this is way, 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 way ahead of of what's being done right now when, you know, we're, we're thinking about this as sort of like a consumer level business. Um, we, we need to be able to make a material that can bring us through until we leave earth we go to different planets in our solar system um and yeah but but that's that's like super far down the road if we can if we can, can if we can guarantee consumers that we can produce a material until we leave the planet and do something else i don't know what more you could want and we can you know we can we can guarantee that nobody's going to die no one's going to be no one's going to be relocated no, there's, no, there's not going to be any threat of famine or thirst from what we're doing. We can keep doing this. We can do it hardcore. We can even abuse it if we want to. And mm -hmm. it's still okay. It's, it's a revolutionary material when you put it, it like that. It's a, it's, a, it's a revolutionary material. Yeah. But you know, the revolution happens very slowly. Yeah. So um, can you talk a little bit about what stone paper feels like or what it is? I mean, does it look like paper? Do you have to bleach it? Like, you know, yeah. what, what's the deal? Uh, so uh, stone, stone paper looks uh, it looks similar to paper. Um, it's naturally white because calcium carbonate is naturally white. Um, it's very smooth. Uh, it has a much more high quality feel than paper. Um, it's actually amazing. Uh, when I when I <laughs> when I go to printers now and I get my hands on regular paper products, I've been working with stone paper so much. Regular paper feels so dirty. It's amazing. <laughs> I, I can feel. I can. I can. When I touch regular paper, I can feel. The trees, like I can, I can feel. I'm telling you, consumers, consumers who buy stone paper products, and they and they just stay in that stone paper world for like a month or two months, and then you rub, just just put your fingers on a uh, on a like a piece of regular paper. You you touch regular paper, and there's something about the stiffness and the roughness and the yellowness and just the the the. It, there is something there that's just like. It, it, how did we forget that this comes from trees? It's so yeah. clearly trees. It's like wood. I mean, it, it's literally like someone sliced up sheets of wood. If you can imagine, <laughs> if, if you took a slice of wood, that's what paper is, and you can feel it. Stone paper doesn't feel like that. Stone paper feels like a very fine sort of like cosmetic powder because calcium carbonate is actually really popular in a lot of different uh, cosmetics, um, but it's, it has a very luxurious feel. Uh, it also doesn't tear as much, and you know it's waterproof, which is you know a big a big sales argument. Um, but yeah, so there's 
It's kind of what paper should have been. Uh, paper, paper is what it should have been. You know, paper, paper has fulfilled its role for the last, you know, few thousand years and has not seen, you know, this kind of innovation in a while. Uh, but, you know, paper, paper did a good job. Like, oh, you know, we can't hate paper. I love it. But we're gone. We're, we're done now with paper. You mm -hmm. said that to get stone paper on the market now and to increase people's awareness, that's kind of like the, the, the main priority for the market, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, what are some of the main problems that are stopping companies from using stone paper? The, the biggest one is definitely because companies just don't know what it is. Right. Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be starting some official surveys uh, in the publishing industry um, over, the next, over the next month. But so far, the customers that I have talked to in, in various industries, a lot of different things in publishing, packaging, labels, uh, a lot of different printing applications, uh, they just have no idea. They've never heard of stone paper before. Um, and that's, that's pretty much due to the fact that it was invented in Taiwan and it's kind of growing in China. And they're just marketing, uh, marketing doesn't really, you know, it doesn't often leave China and succeed in other countries. Uh, there's a there's a huge cultural barrier there right okay so it's just a case of of really increasing aware, awareness for everyone i mean what what's the price difference at the moment do you think that could be a contributing factor to stopping companies from using not, it not really um mm -hmm. you know stone paper if you print stuff on stone paper like a a, a novel for example like a paperback novel mm -hmm. um, your costs your costs might be 20 to 30 percent more expensive but when you consider how publishers, uh, how business for publishers work, um, if their if their costs increase, uh, a, a person might print a novel for three dollars, for three dollars a book, and then they sell it for twenty dollars. It's kind of a you know that's kind of a typical little sale model sales model there. Um, yeah. If if their costs increase to three dollars and fifty cents. Um, you know, it, it makes it makes a bit of a difference on the overall budget of the project, but ultimately, you know, it's just it's just a question of where their priorities are, um, and really a question of if they know what stone paper is or not. And that's that that really you know that, that I emphasize that's that's the main barrier is just people don't know what it is. So, is your focus is Pebble's focus um, getting this into the the publishing world of books? Right now, yeah, exactly. So. Um, the first, the first, you know, crowning achievement of stone paper would be to max out the manufacturer. One of the manufacturers over here, there, there are only two active manufacturers in Asia right now, or, or three, mm -hmm. one in Japan, um, one in Japan, one in Taiwan, and one in mainland China. Um, if, if any of those could max out their productions, we could start to see a realistic price for stone paper. Um, and at that point, uh, it would it would be a it, from a price perspective it would be a much more attractive option for you know all applications, but you know if we can if we can max it out at one manufacturer which we will do by making books, um, mm -hmm. then you know stone paper will have a much better position to grow in the raw materials industry or in the in the market across the world. And what would it do to the climate? Um, if can you, do you have examples of if X percent of books printed every year were printed on stone paper that would reduce X of emissions? In Europe, for example, if we were to replace graphic papers, which are you know high quality papers for graphic applications like books and brochures and magazines, um, kind of you know people people are probably familiar with those sort of slippery, glossy kind of papers, um, mm -hmm. really common. Uh, replacing all of that with stone paper would save 5.5 billion trees, um, even wow. according to the current recycling statistics in Europe, uh, 720 billion liters of water and wow. over 4.9 billion tons of CO2 emissions. Wow. That's a, that's a very specific example, but you know, we're, 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 we're still, we're still pretty far away from, um, considering stone paper as a complete replacement for Europe for European graphic paper. That's huge. Yeah. The first, the first, the first goal is to, uh, you know, make enough, uh, right now, right now, the, the largest manufacturer in the world of stone paper 
their their maximum capacity would be 120,000 tons a year, 120,000 tons a year. Um, and right now they're at like 50,000, just a guesstimate per year. Um, so, you know, we, we would need to, we would need to produce, uh, we would need, we would need to produce books seriously on stone paper to max them out. There would need right. to be, you know, there, there would need to be at least one or two publishers that completely switch to stone paper, or we would need to print, you know, maybe a hundred books on stone paper. And how is the, the European market responding to stone paper when you, you know, when you reach out and have conversations, are people interested really well. or is, yeah, is there really, resistance? Really well. The, the okay. response is definitely best from Europe. Uh, the, the, the very best response is from Germany. Um, you know, just, just because I also have close connections in Germany. Um, mm. Germans are very interested in stone paper development. Um, there's actually a, a German company working on stone paper machinery right now to, to manufacture it. Um, but there, there are some logistical issues when it comes to printing things on stone paper, because there's not a very reliable a reliable supply in Europe. Um, mm. It's small and it's not really prepared to be printing books. Um, and then if you were to print books over here in Shenzhen, um, it would take, you know, five to six weeks to be shipped to Europe. So, right. uh, that, you know, that's, that's an obstacle. And that would basically mean it kind of, it limits, it limits the sales basically to big publishers who make big orders because they already print stuff in China anyways. But uh, yeah, you know, small publishers who need like just in time printing, uh, which, yeah. which needs to be done in, you know, two weeks and shipped in just a few days, it's not, it's not possible for them. But if, the, if there was to be a supply in Europe, that would open oh, yeah. the door to... Yeah, it would, it would explode in Europe. Right, okay, well, that's fantastic. Well, I think we're gonna wrap up there, Hunter. Um, to end, is there anyone that you would like to platform maybe uh, in this industry or whose work has sort of inspired you? Yes, I would like to platform my, my, my old professor and one of my best friends, his name is Volker Janssen. Uh, he is the head of the printing faculty at my old university. Um, his, his insight on the printing industry and what printing means to society is pretty inspiring and i think uh yeah, i think you should have a, a talk with him just to get a, a better appreciation for um the basics of what this is about okay thank you so much hunter no this was a kind of mind-blowing conversation that's contrary to everything um <laughs> i understand is your sort mm -hmm. of average consumer so thank mm -hmm. you thank you so much for for shedding some light yeah, um, I, I, hope, potential. I, I hope other people who are listening um, also feel a little bit of inspiration. Um, yeah, a lot, of, lot of, a lot of exciting things coming up. Could you uh, maybe tell people where they can reach you if they want to find out more about what you do? Maybe read your white paper or even contact Pebble uh, to introduce stone uh, paper in their work. Uh, specifically, uh, I would just recommend going to the website at pebbleprinting.com. Mm -hmm. or visiting the YouTube channel. There's a lot of good stuff there if you're short on time. Uh, just type in Pebble Printing Group in, in YouTube and you'll see a few videos. And that'll also take you to the website and to some contact forms and sample requests and price quotes and all the stuff that people might need. Okay, Fab, I will link that in the show notes. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Thank you, Hunter. Thank you. Hey everyone, you can find the link to Hunter's business, Pebble Printing Group, in the show notes and also his white paper on stone paper, which is a really fascinating read about sustainability. Thank you for supporting Platform Enterprise. We would love to know what you think, so do leave a review. And if you liked it, please give the show a five-star rating. It really helps increase our visibility and therefore the visibility of the phenomenal people we speak to every week. You can also find Platform Enterprise on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and sign up for the newsletter at stories.platformenterprise.com. Okay, thanks for listening. See you next week.